The letter is presented by Hunt a Killer. If you love intricate puzzles and unpredictable mysteries, Hunt a Killer could be exactly what you've been waiting for. They make immersive murder mystery games where you get to be the detective. You can pick from standalone one-shot criminal cases, longer multi-chapter mystery boxes, jigsaw puzzles, books, or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. They also make great gifts for the game, mystery, or true crime lover in your life. Solve a mystery, hunt a killer. Go to huntakiller.com slash the letter and use the code the letter for $10 off your purchase. That's huntakiller.com slash the letter and code the letter. If you need the news, but also need to feel smarter and calmer, then you need to get in Andy Slavitt's bubble. Andy is a former White House advisor and the ultimate outsider's insider. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Andy offers his access to leading experts. Join Andy for discussions on COVID, gun violence, climate change, and more. In the Bubble with Andy Slavitt is available wherever you get your podcasts. Lemonada. A warning to listeners. This podcast includes descriptions of gun violence and associated trauma. Please take care when listening. When I was on the side of the road and I had left Zach to get help, I think I started feeling guilt that that moment that I wasn't with him and that he likely had died and I didn't. And that's never left you? No. Yvette Rodier has lived most of her adult life with the kind of regret that few people experience. It's the guilt of a survivor. But to understand why she feels this way, we need to know who she was before a stranger with a gun upended her life on August 28, 1996. From KSL Podcasts, I'm Amy Donaldson, and this is The Letter. Episode 2, The Survivor. Yvette has always been reluctant to draw attention to herself. No one understands this better than her younger sister, Danielle. She was the big sister that was too afraid to ask the server for ketchup. I would go up to the counter and ask for ketchup because she didn't like to put herself out like that. It's not that Yvette was shy exactly. She just prioritized other people's needs before her own. She was always just very quiet and put together and a peacemaker. She was always really social, though, but she kind of let people come to her. The Rodier family didn't spend much time in one place when Yvette, Danielle, and their little brother, Brandon, were young. Their father, a doctor from Chile, moved the family from Provo, Utah, to Missouri, to Idaho, and back to Salt Lake City, all before Yvette was in fourth grade. When Yvette was eight, Danielle was five, and Brandon was four, their parents divorced. They never discussed how the divorce changed their lives. But Danielle says if Havette was struggling, she couldn't tell. She was just always so accepting of things as they come. And, and then not only just accepting, but she would also take on the role of comforting. Like, I would be the one having a fit about it, and then she would comfort me and maybe put her feelings aside. She hasn't ever put herself first in her life. And that's a beautiful attribute that she's just self-sacrificing always for anyone around her. She's always been the biggest giver. She's the biggest giver I know. Yvette says she gets that from her mother, Linda Dart Rodier, also a giver. Oh, my mom was so doting, so attentive. After the divorce, it was Linda who built a life for Yvette and her siblings. Her life revolved around her kids, her entire life. Linda passed away in 2018 after a long battle with breast cancer. But Yvette found inspiration in her mother's willingness to do the hard things that life often demands. 
my mom was smart. She went to college. She got her master's degree after she got a divorce. And she's always driven us to push ourselves and be better. Since I couldn't talk to Yvette's mother, I spoke with her aunt, Linda's younger sister, Tony Sullivan. Tony says after the divorce, Linda went back to school and started a career in social work, all while raising three children on her own. So she, incredible. But part of the reason that's important is because that's part of the example that Yvette had as a mom who, you know, you don't stop, you keep going no matter what, but you don't just continue. You set your expectations high and you achieve them. As Yvette grew up, Tony could see that she took after her mother in many ways, and she appeared to have a bright future ahead of her. She's extremely smart, and she did so well in school and loved school. Yvette just always made good choices, and it was for the right reasons. It was because she could see the big picture typically. She was a social butterfly, but also for the right reasons, because she was the one who was friends to everybody. She was always concerned about the one sitting on the sideline or the person on the outside. She pulled everybody in to make them feel warm and appreciated. That's how she felt about people. By the summer of 1996, Yvette graduated from high school with honors. She was accepted to the University of Utah where she planned to chase her dream of being a journalist. From Danielle's perspective, Yvette had all the possibilities in the world open to her. The sister who didn't want to bother a server for ketchup was a leader in her own quiet way. She was my role model, you know, she was the dancer and the uh, senior class president and junior prom queen and I just looked up to her and was nowhere near anything like that. The, it was just a struggle for me to go to school, but to see how easy it was for her to get good grades that she didn't ever have homework in the afternoon because she got it done in class. And then she had time to hang out with her friends and the endless boys who were always courting her and <laughs> coming by. Among those boys coming around was Zachary Snar, though Yvette insists they had always just been good friends. The friendship took root in junior high, but grew significantly stronger when Yvette spent her sophomore year in France. Zach was the only friend that wrote me letters the entire time. And they were on these cute pieces of paper that you could fold up and the paper was the envelope. It was just this nice connection that he was the only person who cared for a year where I was. So that was really nice to get home and still feel like he was keeping track and, and remembered me and missed me. Their first official date was August 28, 1996 the night of a full moon. That night was the very first night Zach asked me out on a date, actually. We'd hung out so many times before, but that was the very first time he just asked me and it was, no one else was going and I didn't know what we were going to do, but he picked me up and we went to dinner and then he wanted to surprise me and he was gonna teach me how to take pictures of the moon in black and white. In just a week, they were both going to start their freshman year at the same university. So it was just a fun, like, catch up on what's been happening over the summer and looking forward. Like, it was kind of more ad adulty, if you will, for teenagers to just talk about what's ahead of us, that there's adventures ahead still. Do you remember where you ate or what you did? Yeah, we ate at Salt Lake Pizza and Pasta. Mm -hmm. I had a ham and cheese calzone. It was delicious then. <laughs> and then after that, that's when we headed up the canyon. It was about a 20-minute drive into the Wasatch Mountains headed east. Zach took an exit, drove on a curvy road into a canyon, and then pulled into a dirt parking lot. As they were getting out of the Bronco, they saw a white pickup truck pull in, but they didn't see who was inside. Otherwise, they had Little Dell Reservoir to themselves. They walked past a gate, down a paved walkway. On their left was the water. Up the hill to their right was the canyon road. They walked about 50 yards, half the length of a football field, until Zach decided it would be a good spot to take photos. Zach had brought a blanket uh, that it was a blanket his mom had made for his dad out of denim jeans. And he had a jacket for me and put out the blanket. And then he was getting out the tripod 
when most of it happened. So I don't even know that the camera was out of the case, but he was working on the tripod. In retrospect, Yvette remembers feeling a little off when she noticed a stranger coming down the path. We both just kind of brushed it off. I mean, we're in Utah in the mountains, and it's like eight or so at night. Like, bad things don't happen then. And this is where Yvette stops. She chooses not to revisit the traumatic events of that night. Yvette has told this story many times in her life. But at some point, she decided she didn't want to relive the worst details of that night ever again. I don't remember the last time I did it, but it wasn't good for me. And I just remember the anxiety before, the anxiety after. It just worked up too much emotion. I realized I don't have to do this. Instead, 18-year-old Yvette will speak for her. That's after this break. I'm really excited to tell you about the Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast that we think the listeners of The Letter will also enjoy in their podcast queue. In every episode of this show, Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people, from athletes, authors, and scientists, to FBI agents, political activists, and even hostage negotiators. Jordan Harbinger has an undeniable talent for getting his guests to share stories that they may never have shared publicly before. His conversations are full of never-been-heard-before stories and thought-provoking insights. And without fail, he pulls out tactical bits of wisdom from each guest And you can't help but be a more informed, critical thinker. A recent episode had me examining my own life. It was with financial psychologist Dr. Brad Klontz on how our financial choices are often the result of beliefs and habits that were instilled in us as children. It was fascinating. But honestly, with new episodes every week coming out weekly, the top spot for my favorite episode is constantly evolving. You cannot go wrong with adding The Jordan Harbinger Show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting, and there's never a dull show. Go to jordanharbinger.com slash start for more episode recommendations, or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. In my life, there's never enough time to read all the great books that have been written. My days are spent on the move, which is why Audible is one of my favorite apps. While I love reading, there is also something about listening to a story that feels different, maybe slightly more intimate. The best part of Audible is that I can listen while I hike, clean my house, or run errands. Audible has an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries, self-help, wellness, business, and more. As an Audible member, I get to choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. Right now, I'm listening to The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. It's based on what happened at a real reform school in Florida for more than 111 years. It's gut-wrenching, maddening, and completely captivating. I also just finished Between Two Kingdoms, a memoir by Sulika Jawad, who spent her early 20s battling leukemia. This one is read by the author, and it's so beautifully written about where the best and worst parts of our lives overlap that I had to buy the hard copy so I could scribble some notes as I listened. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it for free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash the letter or text the letter to 500-500. That's audible.com slash the letter or text the letter to 500-500 to try Audible for free for 30 days. Audible.com slash the letter. Would you state your name, please? Yvette Dart Rodier. Yvette detailed what happened to her in a Salt Lake City courtroom at a preliminary hearing just seven months after that night. Actors read the words of Yvette and prosecutor Bob Stott, who questioned her in that hearing. About how long had you been on the blanket when you saw this other person? Two minutes, three minutes. What was the person doing? Making us nervous. It was a man, and he was walking in and out so that you have the pavement, then there's the trees on the side or bushes, and he was walking back and forth in between. The man approached Zach and Yvette from behind, asked them a question about where the paved road went. They said they didn't know and turned back around to face the water. Yvette heard gunshots. Too many to count. 
she screamed. Did anything happen to your body? Totally fell to my left side. You were sitting and fell over? My torso, yeah. Then my bottom half just sort of stayed the same. Could you tell what happened to Zach? I could feel him behind me. His body fell behind me. There was a pause, and I just hoped it was done. I hoped it was over. But it was not. The smell of sulfur and metal burned her nose. About 30 seconds after that first barrage of bullets, she heard the man reload his gun. He fired several more times, this time pointing the weapon directly at Yvette. She willed herself not to move, not to breathe. She pretended to be dead. The gunshot stopped, and the person leaned over me to reach to Zach, and my eyes were open. I didn't dare close them. What did you see? I saw a gun, and I saw his face. How close was the face to you? Very close. I could feel the breath. I could feel him breathing. He searched Zach's pockets. Then he rolled a vet over and put his hands in her pockets. She worried about what else he might do. But then he ran away in the direction of the parking lot. Were you able to move? I didn't try. I was hot and my body tingled and it felt like I was sweating but that was blood. Yvette heard footsteps approaching again, heavy breathing. The man reached in Zach's pockets once more, this time finding his keys. Then he was running up the hill again. She heard Zach's bronco roar to life. Yvette remained frozen, even as she heard the wheels moving over the dirt parking lot, pulling onto the paved road and driving away. How long did you kind of just lay there? 15 seconds after the car left, then I tried to move. My right leg couldn't support me. I tried several times and I just kept falling. Were you able to see Zach at that time? I looked up towards him and right now my memory has just, I don't have, I don't know what he'd look like or anything. I yelled his name. He didn't answer. I touched him. I don't know where I touched him, but I knew he was dead. A car pulled up. I heard a woman's voice get out of the car, and I yelled, help, help, we've been shot. You called out. Were you able to get a response? They said okay. What did they say? They said okay and left. Yvette had no idea if help was coming. I didn't know what else to do, but I knew I had to get help, and I knew that up above me, it would have taken a long time to go back up the asphalt, then over to the road. And I knew that the road was above me, so I knew I could go up the hill. So instead of heading back towards the parking lot, Yvette decided to try and crawl directly toward the canyon road, up the hillside. There was no path to follow. Tell us about the terrain that you had to go across. Very rocky. Lots of little prickly things, lots of bushes, and grass, and weeds. Sometimes there were big rocks that I banged my knees against. My ears were ringing really loud. I hated that. And I was still really, really hot. The whole time up the mountain, I kept brushing away my hair because it kept getting in my face. And it was all sticky and yucky. I didn't realize there was blood. I thought that was sweat or something. What happened at the top? I stayed on my knees and I flagged down a car. Then I got a little nervous. I wondered if they would stop. I wondered if somebody would help me. If somebody would get to Zach. If somehow he would live. Salt Lake County Sheriff's Detective Keith Stevens was just minutes away when he heard the call on his radio that night. 
it was a passing motorist who found a vet. A nurse was one of the passerbys that came by, which was fortunate for everybody involved. The first thing he saw in his headlights when he approached the reservoir was a vet on the side of the road talking with law enforcement and rescue workers. I drive up uh, almost simultaneously with emergency vehicles on, on the roadway above Little Dell. And there's several people frantically running around. It's pretty chaotic. I could see blood. I could considerable amount of blood. I wasn't close enough, but I could hear very faint things that she was, she was talking. She was very, very concerned about her friend that was down below. That was primarily what she was talking about. I didn't want to interfere with some of the medical things that were going on, but the focus was all on Yvette because she was, you know, in trouble. After the break, we'll visit the scene of the crime with Detective Stevens. Tired of the same old game nights? Bored with the same old board games or card games? Looking for a fun new activity to do with your family, your partner, your friends, or even by yourself? You should check out Hunt a Killer. With Hunt a Killer, you get to be the detective, sorting through evidence, piecing together clues, and solving the case in an immersive murder mystery game. Each Hunt a Killer box is a complete murder mystery that you have to solve. Pick from standalone one shot crimes, longer multi chapter mystery boxes, jigsaw puzzles, books, or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. Just like real detective work, you must establish means, motive, and opportunity for each suspect. It's like your own episode of CSI combined with an escape room. I received the Dead on the Vine box, which was a twisting, turning, totally consuming whodunit. In this game, the family's matriarch is poisoned, and the killer had to be a member of her family. We love the ciphers, puzzles, and secrets we had to uncover in solving the crime. And because I've not so secretly wanted to be a private detective since I was a kid, I can't wait to start my next case. Take the case at huntakiller.com slash the letter and use code the letter for $10 off your purchase. That's huntakiller.com slash the letter and code the letter. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. A good therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. And BetterHelp Online Therapy can give you access to the right therapist for you. If I can share a little bit about my own mental health struggles. As a survivor of domestic abuse, therapy became my lifeline, a way out of what felt like endless darkness and pain. It has helped me more effectively manage problems throughout my life, some of them big and complicated like PTSD, while others are more mundane like phases of life changes. I just recently started using BetterHelp, and I'm a huge fan not just of what they do, but how they do it. Being able to talk with a licensed therapist who is matched with me and my specific needs in my own home, sometimes at times that a traditional therapist wouldn't be available, has been life-changing. I am so grateful for BetterHelp. BetterHelp can match you with a therapist after you fill out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists anytime. Honestly, this process was much easier and much faster than the traditional routes I've used in the past. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. When you want to become a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash the letter today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash the letter. It's hard to imagine what Yvette went through that night without seeing where it happened. So I went to the site with Keith Stevens, who is now retired. He was the lead investigator on the case, and it was his suggestion that we visit the reservoir. So on a windy day in early spring, Keith and I met the show's producer, Andreas Martin, in the now paved parking lot at Little Dell Reservoir. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Keith, this okay. is Andrea. Andrea, this is the area where Zach and Yvette were setting up to watch the moon has changed significantly. They moved the dock, right? Some of that's because of updates to the reservoir, and some of that is just Mother Nature. Bigger trees, different foliage. But even 25 years later, Keith cannot forget the scene he encountered that night. 
there was a full moon that night, and even the light from that wasn't enough to illuminate any, anything through all the brush, and you could barely see the asphalt roadway to walk on. Of course, we started using flashlights, but it was extremely dark and very quiet up here. Keith points to the hills behind the reservoir. So they had a perfect view of that. Beyond the hills are mountains topped with snow. But when Zach and Yvette were here in late summer, those rocky peaks would have been bare. The hillsides were covered with dry grass, evergreen trees, scrub oak, and sagebrush. I remember that hill right there, and I, I can remember the moon over it right about where the jet strafe is up there. This is about where it was when we got here. And I can't tell you if it was cresting or already up when we got here. It's kind of the things I wasn't paying attention to a little bit. The crime scene, though, Keith remembers vividly. Yeah, I, I can see the uh, the holes in the asphalt where the bullets either missed or went through, through and through one of the tissues of either two of them. The blood on the blankets, the blood that was on Zach, it was starting to dry. So, yeah, I, I've, I can visualize those as like looking at pictures. Do you let yourself think very much about the kid, like the like about Zach when you're on the scene processing it and sort of going through the motions of an investigation, or do you? Well, at that time in my life, uh, I would have been the same age as his parents. So I, have ki I had kids his age, so I was looking almost like at my kids, you know, looking at the same kind of clothing, same kind of shoes. It's difficult to separate yourself from that. As for Yvette, Keith still can't fathom what she endured in order to survive. Even after arriving at the hospital, she had so many wounds, no one could say exactly how many times she'd been shot. We came back a couple times to photograph both at night and during the daytime just to get that different perspective. And so um, it, was, it was just unbelievable. It was like, did this really happen? Somehow, even with her body riddled with bullets. Yvette pulled herself up that steep grade and through rough terrain to flag down a car. All so right. do you want to walk up to the, try to walk up the road? To where, do, do you want to try to go the path that Yvette would have had to go? Yeah, she would have came right off of here. Navigating around the scrub oak and large rocks and animal droppings wasn't easy. Those you know are that? big. Those are mustards. There is no direct route from the <laughs> reservoir to the road. Does this ever like blow you away that she did this? Every time. In this, in combination of how she kept her wits about her, I mean, first time she came face to face with anything like this. I imagine not being able to see. Pitch black. Imagine doing this at night. Yeah. Thinking that somebody might come back for you. And just every light that passes, like, oh, please send another one, right? Yeah, I got to, I, hopefully that one will be there when I get up there. And this part of the climb. Yeah, this is I'm ridiculous. Sure this, this would have been the area she definitely would have had to crawl up. The last part before the road was the steepest. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't get up. Here, Keith puts out his hand and pulls Andrea, who's holding a recorder in one hand, up that last part of the hill. Thank you. Hmm. So that was hard to do even. I know. Without being shot. Yeah. And that would have been the only sounds really up here. Would have been the sounds from the cars. This is dead quiet and just black. At Yvette's house that night, it was pretty late in the evening when the phone rang. But her sister Danielle was still awake in her room. In those days, they had a landline with more than one phone. So when the phone rang, Danielle picked it up. And so did her mother. I heard the person on the other end of the line say, Yvette's been involved in an accident and she's asking for you. So I ran upstairs and said, Mom, I'm coming with you. And we went down to the hospital. 
And the whole way we were driving there, my mom was like, it couldn't be that bad because she's asking for me and she's conscious. But never in our wildest dreams could we have imagined what had actually happened. When they arrived at the hospital that night, Yvette was already in surgery, so they couldn't see her. They were told only that she'd been involved in a shooting. Danielle, who was 16 years old at the time, can only imagine what her mom was going through. She's an incredibly strong woman. She was extremely composed. She was holding out to really panic, I think, until she knew everything that had gone on. But we did find out before Yvette was out of surgery that Zach had been killed. And then she she lost it. It was really hard for my mom. I was 16. I didn't understand anything that was happening. You know, I just knew that it was, I was glad that I was there for my mom in that time. And of course, we were worried about Yvette. We didn't know if she was going to make it. So once we heard that Zach died, we immediately assumed that maybe Yvette wasn't going to do so well. What I remember more than anything was we had gone up to the chapel to pray and it was dark and it was in the middle of the night and I think Zach's parents had been notified at that time and Sai Snar walked in the door and her and my mother looked at each other and they both just started sobbing and ran to each other and held each other it was really beautiful to see the two moms just embrace each other. The, there was this this sadness between them uh, that was really powerful. I remember that, the power of that sadness. When I wake up, I'm in the hospital. My mom's with me. I just know Zach's dead. I don't know how, but I'm sure of it. I don't know that my mom confirmed it for me for a bit, but she was very tender and obviously distraught. And then the next thing I remember is when Zach's family came to visit me. It felt like it was early in the morning. I don't remember what time. But looking back, I just can't imagine that they, after knowing that their son had died, that that's where they went. But I can still see their faces walking in the room. And Sai came to me very first and hugged me. And she leaned in and just said, I'm so glad he was with you because I know he was happy. And I don't remember the flood of emotion that I feel right now. I'm assuming I had it at that time. I was also heavily sedated and drugged. But I remember that, those words, daily. And it, it was such a gift that they would take that time and come and visit me and tell me that, you know, especially the day after their son's been killed. What was, you said the flood of the emotion you feel now. What do you feel now? Um, Gratitude, appreciation, I guess that's the same. Mm -hmm. Um, Sadness, guilt that I'm here, that, that they had to come to the hospital. How soon did you feel guilty about surviving? Was it right away? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that day, the first day. I think... There was probably guilt that night, too, when I was on the side of the road and I had left Zach to get help. I think I started feeling guilt that that moment that I wasn't with him and that he likely had died and I didn't. And that's never left you? No. Gradually, the extent of Yvette's injuries became more clear, though no one knew exactly how many times she'd been shot. I was hit several times in the head, so there was a lot of blood and and damage to my skull. 
he used hollow tip or hollow point bullets. And so one of them hit my left side in my back and went all the way through and got lodged in my left inner thigh. One hit my left side and just totally expanded and blew up the left side, just opened it up raw. Um, and then one more along my shoulder. So we don't know how many on my head because there was also the tripod got hit a lot. So there were bits of metal from the tripod that was going out and, in, you know, mm-hmm. flying through the air. So at what point do you realize, like, it's pretty miraculous that you survived? I, I don't, I just feel like I've always felt that way. Like, I don't know when that point came, but it's always just been crazy amazing that I survived and Zach didn't. There's no reason I should be here. He he reloaded his gun and aimed at my head to make sure I died. I, I It's just always been crazy and so lucky. Almost immediately, Yvette had to contend with a swarm of media attention. I do remember we did a press conference, and I remember that being extremely traumatic. The random brutality of the case caused outrage in the community, and that was punctuated by intense media coverage, both locally and nationally. Reporters converged on the Salt Lake Valley, seeking to interview anyone and everyone who knew something about the teenagers involved. Investigators say the 19-year-old told them he decided to randomly shoot two teens while they were taking pictures. He had mentioned that he wanted to use the gun and shoot somebody. Yvette survived. Zach died immediately. We've been friends, best friends, all my life. I don't know what I'm going to do. The reporters camped outside the hospital, the Snar home, the Rodier home, the residence of the shooter's family. They talked to friends, acquaintances, landlords, principals, police, anyone even peripherally associated with those involved. Yvette remembers the hospital giving her an alias, but once the name was leaked to the media, the medical staff had to move her to a new room. They came in and told my mom, hey, if you guys will just do an interview, this will all stop. All these people will just go away. They said no one would come back and you wouldn't have to do any other interviews. And I think now, knowing what I know, I wish someone would have said, no way, what are you doing? But I know we had realized we had inconvenienced the hospital, if you will, and made it hard for them to do certain things. So I did it. Remember, this is a vet who didn't even want to bother anyone for ketchup, who never liked to draw attention to herself or make waves. There she was, lying in her hospital bed, severely wounded, on painkillers, hooked up to tubes, a stuffed teddy bear under one arm, surrounded by cameras and microphones. She tried to keep it focused on Zach. He's always been there for me. He likes to call me and tease me about anything. In the video, she looks up and smiles at the reporters. But I remember just feeling like, I don't know why I'm telling all these strangers what happened to my best friend and why I'm laying here in bed doing this, but I did it. What emotion did you feel when you're doing it? I think there was a lot of pressure on myself to make sure I was showing emotion, that I wasn't numb, even though I was fairly numb at that point, but I wanted them to be sure to know that this is sad and I am hurt. Uh, There was also anger, but at that age, I didn't know how to even express that I was angry about this or scared about this or didn't want to do it. Yvette had been thrust into the spotlight, torn between her instinct to avoid attention and her desire to put others first, to make other people happy. I'm a people pleaser, so it was just extreme pressure to not mess up to be normal, quote unquote. So it was it it was a lot of pressure and just feeling like I better not mess up because they are watching me 
as the girl who got shot. Yvette was the sole eyewitness to Zach's murder, and she wanted to do whatever she could to help. Detective Keith Stevens interviewed her in the hospital to get a full accounting of what she remembered from that night. And as you're talking to her, what, what's your impression of her? Um. Even 25 years later, Yvette holds a special place in this detective's heart. Yeah, it's um, extremely selfless. She put um, all of her injuries aside to help with the investigation. She was very eager to help, very eager to, in her own way, speak for Zach. Has this case stuck with you? Yeah. Just knowing what she went through and how strong she was and how she survived, it's amazing. In that press interview from her hospital room, Yvette told the world that she would pick herself back up and live her life. She would go to college as planned. Um, I'm still planning on starting at the U in the fall. So as of now, those plans haven't changed. And she did. But the truth is, the life she knew was over. She was only just beginning a long road to recovery. Almost immediately, Yvette set some boundaries that would help her heal. Rule number one, she would never say the shooter's name. What I remember is his name was everywhere in the paper. And so was Zach's name and so was my name. But his name seemed to be prominent and it just made him more human to me. And what he did was inhumane. And so not using his name has been very helpful for me. Yvette couldn't anticipate all the challenges she would face in her life. But she will hold fast to this boundary and others in an effort to protect herself. She will build a new life in defiance of this unnamed shooter and what he took from her. I didn't have a choice. Zach didn't have a choice. But once I lived and I'm coming out into society, I have all the cards. I have all the choices. Next time on The Letter. At this time, it appears that uh, the victim's vehicle was taken by the suspect. They don't know who he is. Um, it's a, a Bronco. That's as much as I've got right now. We knew that Zachary's vehicle was gone and there was a vehicle left there. There was a vehicle registration there that provided us with a name, address. So immediately people were dispatched from the scene without having any real information other than we have two people that have been shot. The individual's obviously armed and dangerous. Hi, this is producer Andrea Smartin here to let you know about some exclusive bonus material. This week, Amy digs deep into grief and the ways in which it's misunderstood. In this bonus episode, she talks to a grief counselor about how it's not something you just get over and how grief is connected to love and growth. You can get all the bonus content and some great things we couldn't fit into the main story by subscribing to Lemonada Premium. You can subscribe right now in the Apple Podcast app by clicking on our podcast logo and then click the subscribe button. The letter is researched and reported by me, Amy Donaldson. It's written by myself and Andrea Smartin, who is also responsible for production and sound design. Mixing by Trent Sell. Special thanks to Nina Ernest, Becky Bruce, Kellyanne Halverson, Ryan Meeks, Josh Tilton, Ben Kiebrick, Dave Colley, and Ed Brass. Main musical score composed by Allison Leighton Brown. 
with KSL Podcast executive producer Cheryl Worsley. For Lemonada Media, executive producers Jessica Cordova Kramer and Stephanie Whittleswax. And executive producers Paul Anderson and Nick Pinella with Workhouse Media. If you like our show, please give us a rating and a review. It helps people find us. Follow us at theletterpodcast.com and on social at The Letter Podcast. The Letter is produced by KSL Podcasts and Lemonada Media in association with Workhouse Media. Hey, The Letter listeners, we want to hear from you. You know we love our sponsors for a ton of reasons, but one of the main ones is because they help us keep the lights on. And there's a really easy way that you can help us draw new advertisers and hear ads for things that you're most interested in. Filling out our quick anonymous survey at lemonadamedia.com slash survey. By answering just a few questions, you can help us find new brands to connect with and also share feedback about show content you'd like to see across the network. And to sweeten the deal, once you've completed the survey, you can enter for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. I promise the survey is short and sweet and will help us play ads you don't want to skip. And also, keep bringing you content you love. Just go to lemonadamedia.com survey.